172, only four means prohibited. Oh, you believe, eat from the good things we provided for you and be thankful to God. If you do worship him alone, he only prohibits for you the eating of animals than themselves without human interference. Blood, eating of pigs, and animals dedicated to other than God. If one is forced to eat these, Without being malicious or deliberate, he incurs no sin. God is forgiver, most merciful. Corrupted religious leaders conceal the Quran's miracle. Those who conceal God's revelations in the scripture in exchange for a cheap material gain eat but fire into the be their bellies. God will not speak to them on the day of resurrection, nor will he purify them. They have incurred a painful retribution. It is they who chose the restraint instead of guidance, and the retribution instead of forgiveness. Consequently, this is because God has revealed his scripture bearing the truth and those who dispute the scripture are the most ardent opponents righteousness defined righteousness is not turning your faces towards the east or the west righteous are those who believe in God the last day, the angels, the scripture and the prophets and they give the money cheerfully to the relatives the orphans, the needy, the traveling alien the beggars and to free the slaves and they observe the contact prayers a lot, and they and give the obligatory charities a cot, and they keep their word whenever they make a promise, and they steadfastly persevere in the face of persecution, hardship, and war. These are the truthful, these are the righteous. Let me stop there to see if anyone has any questions about what was read thus far. It's worth, uh, just because we read the verse discussing the uh, dietary prohibitions, um, I don't know if anyone wants to make any uh, comments about that. I mean, consistently th throughout the Quran, we see that there's uh, only uh, four dietary prohibitions. And uh, these four are spelt out here uh, in this verse, as well as uh, Surah 5, verse 3, uh, Surah 6, verse 145, and Surah 16, verse um, 115. Uh, 115 or 114. But yeah, uh, all these are constituting basically uh, animal products. So for instance, like carry-on. Uh, it doesn't actually say, you know, uh, dead animals. It just says carry on. We, we know that that constitutes uh, basically uh, animals. It says running blood uh, in Surah 6145. Uh, and then the third dietary prohibition is the meat of pigs. It's the only time that you'll see the word meat actually used in the verse. And then the uh, fourth dietary prohibition is uh, animals dedicated to other than God. And if you read the, the footnote, it says... Uh, where is it? Is it this one throughout the Quran? Only four meats are prohibited, and it you know cites six one forty five, six one fifteen, appendix sixteen. Says dietary prohibitions beyond these four are tantamount to idol worship. Um, that basically, if you slaughter an animal to other than God, then that animal is prohibited to be eaten. Uh, somebody asked me recently about the category of carrion and some of the modern slaughtering practices. And so if a cow was killed at your house and then you drove it to the slaughtering house to be cut up and stuff, you know, that those were the kinds of questions. And uh, I honestly didn't really know. As long as the, the animal was killed with the intention of it being food, right? And it wasn't dedicated to other than God. So regarding carry-on, if you kill the animal without the intention of it being food, like roadkill, you know, unless you intended saying, hey, I'm going to take out this deer so I can eat it. And the mechanism I'm going to use, I'm going to drive my truck right into it. Uh, unless it was done with the intention of it being food, then it constitutes as a carry-on.
And we have this uh, example in Surah uh, 5 verse 3, and we can get more into the details if needed, but basically there's a word zaki, uh, which means to slaughter with the intention of it being food. So for instance, when it says uh, animals uh, that are gored, who are uh, fallen from a height, bludgeoned to death, uh, all these kind of categories, uh, it says unless you save your animal before it dies, and that word is zaki, which means to in essence slaughter with the intention of it being food. Um, and then we have dhoab, which means to basically kill without the intention of it being food. As it also says, uh, also prohibited are animals that are sacrificed on altars. And obviously, they're sacrificed by a human, but the word that's used is when someone kills something without the intention of it being food. Uh, also, tangentially, um, where you have animals that are trained in the ways of God to help you hunt. I mean, I, I always wondered, well, what if they kill the the bird? And uh, so that kind of informed it to me, too. I, I was thinking, well, the animal kills it before it brings it back, I think, unless that's not being killed in the way of God. Yeah, as long as it's killed with the intention of it being food, that's the, the, the distinction between carry-on from what food is lawful to eat. But what's interesting about this, is, you know, an apple can't be carry-on, right? A banana can't be carry-on. Bread can't be carry-on. Uh, that this is only constituting animals. So as long as the animal was killed, how, irrespective of how it was killed, uh, with the intention of it being food, and it wasn't dedicated to other than God, then it's lawful to eat. That's actually a good point regarding the uh, what trained dogs and falcons uh, catch for you. You know, one of the, uh, the misconceptions in traditional Islam is that uh, they say that dogs are najas, like oh, anything a dog touches is impure, it's dirty. And uh, uh, this shows that, you know, a dog, it doesn't carry the food in its paws, right? It puts it in its mouth, uh, that this is still lawful to uh, to eat. So it's uh, another uh, proof, the sense that these are like false prohibitions that they've created and they uh, attribute to God. And this kind of touches on the, the next verse. It says, those who conceal God's revelations in the scripture in exchange for a cheap material gain, eat but fire into their bellies. God will not speak to them on the day of resurrection, nor will he purify them. They have incurred a painful retribution. One thing that makes me think is this concept of halal and kosher that you see on food. It'll be like, you know, all these miscellaneous foods that have nothing to do with uh, the dietary prohibitions instituted in the Quran. It will pay someone to uh, authenticate that, yes, this food is halal. So you'll see like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, peanut butter and uh, pickles and things that are, you know, not part of the dietary prohibitions uh, being labeled as halal. Um, and this is just a way for them to basically, uh, again, it's like uh, for a cheap material gain, eat but fire into their bellies. They're creating a category, you know, uh, that has no basis in the Quran in order to line their pockets. Yes, in the holy Zamzam water. <laughs> what does it mean by righteousness is not turning your fingers towards the east or the west? What does that mean? What do you think it means? Mm, um, I don't know. Is it talking about prayer? Is that what you think it's talking about? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I have a... a, a it, this is my opinion, right? So it's, feel free to to disagree with it. What I think this is signifying is that, you know, there's a tendency of looking at righteousness uh, outwardly in the sense that you're looking to the east, you're looking to the west, you're looking at kind of like uh, things to confirm. But uh, when you look at what it's defined as, it's what's inside that defines righteousness, uh, not these uh, uh, outward kind of uh, de de depictions of it. Um, that's my take when it says righteousness is not turning your faces towards the east or the west. Righteous are those who believe. So, in, in essence, rather than looking outwards, you got to look inwards.
I don't know if uh, anyone else has uh, opinions because I guarantee there's yeah a lot more um, angles to this uh, this verse. Mm-hmm. And also, what does it mean? Um, it says, uh, like they give the money to a fully, like traveling alien. What what counts as a traveling alien? Who, like anyone who is traveling? Someone who isn't a native or a citizen, right? So, for instance, this is more uh, rele- pertinent to the uh, the past. Now we have, for instance, like illegal aliens or someone who's a. Um, uh, it's a derogatory term now, but. Uh, What's the expression? Uh, like a bum, in the sense where they're they're just traveling, they're just passerbys. They they don't plan on kind of sticking around. Uh, these people typically in a society have the the least voice. They have the least status, and God is calling them out that you know for these people who are just uh, traveling through. Um, that in essence we 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 support them, we help them. Uh, we have the example of uh, Abraham when he had the uh, two guests that came to his uh, uh, dwelling. And uh, he basically got a fat roasted calf for them. It just shows like the level of uh, um, righteousness that Abraham had. Here's two people he didn't know. They're strangers. They're typically treated the worst in society. And, uh, you know, here he is basically preparing the best food he has for them. And then contrast that with the angels when they go to Lot. Uh, and <laughs> the, the, the people go and basically want to rape uh, these individuals. Um, I mean, this is the, the, the degrees of separation between someone who's righteous as uh, Abraham versus like the people of uh, uh, Lot. We can think of it also in the realm of like, say, you know, we, we have this happening, you know, uh, sadly, globally is uh, refugees and people who are seeking asylum. So would anyone who is basically traveling like, for uh, for us let's say for vacation or something uh, do we give them um is that do we give them money is this what it is if you see someone in need this is one of the categories of people that we uh um you know we 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 help out uh it's funny there's this guy he's been on this uh one road i always drive when i go to pick up and uh, uh drop off my uh, kids for a uh, school you can tell he's like he's not He's not from here. He's just passing by. He's got like his backpack, his uh, um, uh, bike, and uh, he's just made a stop. So he's been here. I haven't. It was like he was here every day for like a week, and I haven't seen him since. Um, and you know, people like that where they're just uh, sojourns are, are kind of like another term that's uh, biblically used, where they're they're visitors, they're passerbys, they're they're people who again aren't like uh, living here. They don't have a home. They don't have a homestead. They're just uh, uh, in essence, uh, yeah, passing through. Okay, thank you. And another question. Um, it says like blood. A healing purpose for you, uh, like blood, right? So is that does that count for human blood? Like, let's say your lips bleed or something. Like, would humans, I know you said it's about animals, so would humans be considered, like, an animal? So the the, the context is uh, running blood. Um, that's what's uh, prohibited. And uh, this is, you know, distinguished between, like, blood that's trapped within the, uh, the, the meat. So you can think of it in Surah 6, verse 145, it uses the term poured forth. This is, like, blood you can pour into a cup and drink. Um, I think that's different than, oh, you got a uh, cut on your lip and stuff, uh, you know, if it gets in your mouth. Personally, I think that's different. I think this is, and you do have individuals who uh, who do this, they'll drink blood. Um, you know, they, they think they're uh, vampires of some sorts, and they will drink uh, human blood. God is saying that blood poured forth, uh, drinking blood in that sense, would be a, a prohibited uh, uh, dietary uh, uh, law. One thing that's interesting regarding the dietary prohibitions, um, you know, when you think of why is it that it says pigs, like what is it unique about pigs? Like why doesn't it say monkeys? Like, you know, uh, we're very similar to uh, to monkeys, and I guarantee there's probably a lot of uh, ailments and uh, issues that would arise if people ate monkeys. 
The thing is that the pig is almost designed to be perfect for breeding. Uh, it eats nearly anything. Uh, its gestation period, as far as like having babies, is virtually nothing. They're incredibly rugged, like meaning that you could give them minimal amount of uh, uh, enclosure and they will prosper. They eat anything you put in their path, they will eat, consume, and then uh, quickly produce into uh, to meat. And they make it very tantalizing to basically feed a population via pigs. So one of the things is like, okay, well, what, uh, why could this be a prohibition? Some people just say, oh, in the past they were unclean, blah, 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 blah. The aspect is, if you look at it physiologically, for whatever reason, humans and pigs and monkeys, our physiology are very similar. They recently did a human uh, pig heart transplant. So they got genetically modified pigs. They basically grew a heart and then they placed it into the the uh, uh, the as a replacement for a human being. But there's something genetically connected with the pig that makes them, in essence, very similar to humans. And the problem with that is you have uh, basically two predominant strands of flu. Now we have COVID. But before was basically you had swine flu and avian flu, flu that came from like birds and then flus that came from uh, uh, pigs. This is the predominant each year where we get the seasonal flu. This is where they originate. Now, what's interesting is in 19, uh, uh, eight, 19, uh, 1918, sorry, we had the, the Spanish influenza. And uh, this was a flu that originated from pigs. And the reason that it happened was because people are breeding pigs or in close proximity. So we, we get the, the, the cold from the pig and then we spread it. And then each year it goes back to the pig. It replicates and then it comes back. So at that time, when the population was 1 billion people, in three months, 50 million people died from influenza. That's like 5% of the population in three months was wiped out because of this one uh, uh, flu that originated from a pig. So it's just like for these reasons, it's interesting that aren't exactly clear, uh, you know, when it was, this revelation was first given. This is my belief to why God prohibited uh, us from eating this. You know, God didn't need to prohibit us from eating cockroaches because it's like this is not something that looks tantalizing. It doesn't necessarily taste good. But when it comes to the pig, it's like it tastes good. It's fast. It's like efficient. Uh, it has all these hallmarks that you would look for breeding animals. God is telling us that, you know, by their nature, they're contaminated. We shouldn't basically be consuming this. Any thoughts? Yeah. So we see that those who conceal Auzu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim says those who conceal God's revelations in the Scripture. So we know that the mathematical miracle was a revelation from God to Rashad. Uh, it's a revelation in the Scripture. Uh, it was meant for him. So those who conceal God's revelation in scripture in exchange for cheap material gain eat but eat but fire into their bellies. God will not speak to them on the day of resurrection, nor will he purify them. They have, they have incurred a painful retribution. It's they who chose the straying instead of guidance. See so that's actually the consequence of the mathematical miracle. It's not the miracle itself that brings the guidance, but it is the miracle that gives the proof to the messenger to deliver the guidance so those who chose those who conceal it choose straying instead of guidance and their attribution is to the forgiveness consequently they will have to endure hell and so that's why probably the header says corrupted the religious leaders conceal the quran's miracle uh, i think this is in surah 2 verse 23 this is where it's talking about being the mathematical miracle is, is a revelation to uh, Shad Khalifa. That's in uh, 2.23. So that's probably why he links it here, the Quran's miracle. And then, uh, uh, yeah, and this is because, and then the verse continues, says this is because God has revealed the scripture bearing the truth, and those who dispute the scripture are the most ardent opponents. We actually have real people disputing the truth. Uh, this is, sorry, dispute the scripture. 
And they say, for example, even though like all these years, best meta was 19 letters, everyone knew it, it was well documented, everyone accepted it. And then all of a sudden, they said, oh, well, best meta can also be 21 letters. Like, <laughs> they dispute the truth, they dispute the scripture. Like, even though they bore witness to it all this time, now they all of a sudden dispute it. Uh, yeah, so God is, I think it's God is talking about them here. God has revealed the scripture, bang the truth, and those who dispute the scripture are the most ardent opponents. So our, our most ardent opponents are not the average Joe on the street. It's not the average atheist. It's the, it's the people of the scripture that dispute the scripture. In this case, it's the Saudi Arabs, for example, right? Because they, they, they really actively try to fight this miracle. They conceal it. Uh... They try to, even though they proclaimed, like proclaimed all this time, the best man is 19 letters. Now they start trying to change it. Like it's the Quran is 114 chapters. Like nothing can change that. But they try to argue about even that. Like everyone knows that. So this all the, all those. I think this is talking about that. God knows best. Mashallah. They're willing to kind of like uh, throw everything away just to avoid the, the obvious truth uh, that's uh, in front of them. Um, what you stated kind of remind me of this verse. It's uh, with Salah. It says, the arrogant leaders among his people said, the common people who believed. How do you know what Salah, that Salah is sent by his Lord? He said, the message he brought has made us believers. It's interesting. They didn't point to, oh, the camel is what convinced. Like the camel is just a kind of like a flare to get people's attention you know the miracle that's brought is strictly it's not going to make someone necessarily believe uh, it's just to tell them that look what this person is uh, providing the information uh, is not from them it's from god lord of the universe and uh you know at the end of the day it's the message that's really going to determine if it resonates with someone or not Any other uh, comments about what yeah. we uh, we read? Oh, good. Does concealing the truth count as like not telling um uh people the truth? Like uh like you don't tell everyone uh you see about it. Does that count as concealing it? Like do you have to tell everyone basically? Well, you sh what you should do is you get a box, put it in the center of like a populated area, stand on top of it, and just like start uh, proselytizing to everyone. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think so. I think, it, you know, there's two, th two ways I can understand your question. One is, are you obligated to tell everyone everything? And the answer to that, I would say no. Like I tell my kids the same thing. I say, you know, if someone asks you a question you don't want to answer, you don't have to answer it. You know, uh, that doesn't mean you're lying, but you shouldn't lie at the same time. But I understand this is regarding concealing the truth is in essence that they know their position is wrong. And rather than uh, being forthright with it to why their position is wrong. They conceal it in order to get that uh, short-term gain. Um, there's another verse we read the other week. It says, uh, do not inform the believers uh, lest they argue with you. Let me see. Luke 276, it says, when they meet the believers, they say we believe, but when they get together with each other, they say, do not inform the believers of the information given to you by God, lest you provide them with support for their argument concerning your Lord. Do you not understand? So, you know, rather than being forthcoming with someone and saying, like, yeah, your position holds, these are possible reasons to why, uh, out of preservation for their, your, their ego, their opinion, their status, their, you know, financial gains, whatever it is they have. They, they intentionally conceal the information they know um, in order to try to get that short-term gain. Does that answer the, uh, the, the, the question? Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm asking a lot of questions, but I have one more question. That, Ask as many as you want. Yeah, for 2178, um, is it talking about like uh, equivalence as in if someone murders someone, uh, they get murdered too. And also, um, 
like so it's not like if a man kills a woman then the man like it's not like that right it's only for like woman versus woman or man versus man right okay, so we ended up uh stopping actually at 277 but do you want to read 270 uh 178 179 in the uh, footnote and then uh god willing uh we can uh, answer the, the the question oh okay um of uh, subtitle discouraging capital punishment uh 2178 all you who believe equivalence is the law decreed for you when dealing with murder the free for the free the slave for the slave the female for the female if one is pardoned by the victim's kin an appreciative response is in order and an equitable compensation shall be paid this is an alleviation from your lord and mercy anyone who transgresses beyond this incurs a painful retribution 2179. Equivalence is a life saving law for you, all you who possess intelligence, that you may be righteous. Footnotes for 172 and 170. Wait, uh, what footnotes were read? Uh, just 178. That's the only one you have to, uh, okay. if you can read. A footnote for 2178. The Quran clearly discourages capital punishment. Every kind of excuse is provided to spare lives, including the life of the murderer. The victim's kin may find it better, under certain circumstances, to spare the life of the murderer in exchange for an equitable compensation. Also, capital punishment is not applicable if, for example, a woman kills a man or vice versa. There's an entire uh, appendix on the criminal justice system, uh, according to the Quran. And this is just a stipulation that, in essence, it's like... Um, the maximum penalty someone can have is death, uh, but that is only constituted in the sense of, again, uh, man for a man, free for the free, uh, slave for the slave, um, and uh, uh, woman for a woman. Uh, that if someone, for instance, a, uh, a slave kills a, uh, uh, their owner, you know, the capital punishment can't be uh, doled out for the, uh, the, the, the slave. Um, this is just setting some, some limits to it. But at the end of the day, the concept is that, you know, when punishment is instituted, we try to make it as equitable as possible. Meaning, say, for instance, someone uh, steals my car. They say, oh, you know, let's put this guy in jail. It's like, well, OK, maybe this guy had a, a family. Maybe they had a kid. Uh, you know, obviously they have uh, parents that are maybe still living. You know, I'm technically victimizing all these other people at the expense of getting justice for this guy stealing my car. And, you know, what did the, 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 the guy's kid uh, do to deserve this? What did the spouse do? What did the employer of this person do to deserve all this? Um, and so maybe a better uh, outcome is you say, okay, look, you're on house arrest. You're going to be monitored, this and that. And whatever you earn basically goes until I'm uh, fully compensated for the hardship and the, the, uh, um, the issues I had to go through based on your actions. Um, you know, this way, in essence, the guy's still a functional member of a society. Uh, the, the, the kids aren't victimized, the, the spouse isn't victimized, the, the parents aren't victimized, you know, these other facets are uh, not paying the punishment for this guy's bad decision. At the same time, I'm being compensated uh, for my what I had to go through. Just trying to be more um, equitable in dealing out with uh, with any kind of justice. What do you guys think? Peter, so what would be the punishment if a woman killed a man? Michael, can I answer this question? Okay. Yeah, I think basically what is emphasized in the Quran is the sparing of lives. So in the instance where a woman killed a man, it would be focused on the, first of all, execution would not be an option, but it would be the victim's family to determine an equitable amount in financial compensation to restore as much as possible when it comes to the life of the person that was taken. Yeah, so it's not that the, uh, the basically God is setting the, the limit where we say that, okay, capital punishment wouldn't uh, hold under these uh, rules. But it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a uh, deterrent, there isn't going to be a punishment, there isn't going to be a restitution. You know, all these things still uh, are fair game. 
the only thing is it's okay the option of capital punishment isn't um available uh what's interesting there was a case in uh, iran maybe someone can pull up uh god i'll try i'll, I'll find out try to link to it so the, there was a uh, two kids. They're like teenagers and stuff, and they get in an altercation, and one of them pulls a knife and kills the other one. So you know, go ahead. Safa. Um, I have uh, another question. You know, in the verse where it says, um, if someone commits like a gross offense or whatever, that you can kill them or cut off their hands on alternating yeah. hands and feet on alternating sides. So what do you what do you think uh, would justify a punishment like that? It's interesting if you look at the 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 verse. Um, it actually the the context. I want to see if I can pull it up. Oh, oh. <laughs> so it's five thirty three. Uh, let me put it in, and then I'll uh, discuss. It says, the just retribution for those who fight God and his messenger and commit horrendous crimes is to be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off on alternate sides or to be banished from the land. This is to, uh, to humiliate them in this life, and they suffer a far worse retribution in the hereafter. My understanding of this, this is only in the context of war, and I'll explain. If you look at the uh, the Arabic, basically it says, um, you know, So you're saying these are prisoners of war? No, 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 no. These are people who are actively fighting in war. That's the distinction. It, you know, in essence, it, it says in the, the Quran and other verses that basically if they uh, uh, submit, if they repent, you know, in essence, then you can't uh, transgress the, the, the limits. If you look here, only the record of just, uh, retribution, those who they wage war, uh, have... Uh, the the root harab right is basically in essence the same root as war. You'll see it consistently in the uh, the 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 Quran. I don't think that this is just you know kind of like a, a, a you know an offense. It's something very specific that these are people who are actively fighting. Um, that basically the uh, the punishment for those uh, individuals who are actively in the pursuit of fighting uh, is that you know you have the right to basically dole out capital punishment. If you look, so say, for instance, uh, the next verse, exempted are those who repent before you overcome them. You should know that God is forgiver and most merciful. Um, so it's like, you know, this is it, it, the, the fact that you're, you know, uses terms like overcome. What does that mean? Right. It's the, the sense that, OK, these are people, again, who are actively fighting you uh, in war that uh, you're allowed to, to utilize capital punishment. But again, it says uh, if you overcome them and they repent, in essence, like submit and uh you're basically no longer have the uh, the authority to 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 carry out that punishment yeah i see your point uh, the only thing is like it's not about just fighting cuz it, it says and commit horrendous crimes right? the question is 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 that in like it's not or right so it's like basically they're waging war and uh they're uh, committing horrendous crimes can I just comment on that real quick? Absolutely. So that's a really good point. I really appreciate this. So then, obviously, if you're in war, then this makes sense. Then that means within the context of war, horrendous crimes include taking of life. Is that, a, is that not a reasonable uh, assertion? Yeah, yeah that's, that's my Besides the fighting part, what horrendous crime do you commit in war? That would cause the punishment for me to cut off one so, of your hands and the opposite foot. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's usually if you, let's say you slaughter 100 people. Let's say uh, <laughs> there's there's plenty of uh, heinous uh, individuals that have done you know uh, disgusting, uh, just absolutely horrendous uh, acts. But, um, you know, if we were ever in uh, a point where, for instance, we're on the uh, on the other side. Uh, during an active uh, thing of war uh, that, yeah, we're more than willing. I mean, I don't want to get graphic regarding like some of these, uh, the war atrocities that have uh, uh, taken place or that we know of that have been documented. But um, 
see a really disgusting side of uh, human nature. And, uh, you know, God is saying against these uh, these acts, you have a clear authorization. Um, it's it's interesting that, you know, people, they, they take this in the sense of trying to portray the, uh, the Quran in a uh, bad light. But the reality is like, look, we have war. We have people committing heinous, disgusting, terrible acts to, you know, innocent people and children. And uh, uh, the thing is, this is not, how do you put it? It's not just, oh, let's just let them be. We'll just turn the other cheek. It's like God is, in essence, saying, no, against these people, you have every right and you should kind of stand up. Uh, the Quran employs the uh, non-aggression principle, meaning that you're free to, uh, you're not allowed to aggress unless being aggressed upon. And in those uh, cases, you have every right to stand up for your rights, to basically neutralize the, uh, the, uh, uh, the attacks or even the, uh, the, the oppression. Um, I think it's one of those things that it's like, you know, no, no sensible person is going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, if we have a scripture from God that's supposed to discuss all matters of uh, morality, but, you know, what we're allowed to do in the uh, rules of war wouldn't be, uh, 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 you know, discussed. So that that's my two cents is just that this context of uh, uh, four, 533 and stuff is that, you know, it's in war where you have these like terrible, heinous individuals who are committing you know, uh, vast amounts of crimes, be it genocide or, you know, rapes, mutilations, whatever, uh, that you are allowed to basically dole out capital punishment uh, uh, during those times to those people. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, there was this case in uh, Iran. Dude, they have uh, photos of, uh, uh, of this. It's definitely worth uh, seeing. So there was uh, two kids, teenagers and stuff. They get in an altercation. Apparently, they're like on the same soccer team. And uh, one of them pulls a knife and basically kills the other. So then in Iran, it's basically you, you, they hang you, right? It's like that's the, the outcome. Unless the victim's family, they pardon you. They bring the guy out, you know, and stuff like that. He's blindfolded and uh, he's, he's crying. And uh, the sad thing is his mom is sitting right in front row like this old woman. You know, can't stand up she's sitting on the ground like she, you can imagine just the anguish she's going through and the the punishment is that he's standing on a chair and it's the victim's mom is the one who has to pull the chair from underneath his feet and i think this is important saying like look if you're you want to dole out capital punishment this is my personal belief is you have to be the one who pulls the trigger you're the one who has to cause the death you can't just like outsource this to some other individual some henchman and say you do it Right? This is something that God is saying, look, in these conditions, there are situations where you can dole out capital punishment, but it's your responsibility to carry it through. So the mom of the victim's son, uh, yeah, the mom of the victim, she goes up to the uh, the chair, you know, about to pull it. She slaps the guy and says, I forgive you, and then basically uh, walks away. It's just, it's such a powerful thing that, you know, in essence, it's like, it's, I guarantee if it wasn't up to her, if she didn't have to pull the, uh, the, the, the chair from oh, underneath. No, like, if I'm a mother, just to clarify, like, I, if a mother, if she has again? to do the capital punishment herself, is that yeah, yeah, so she has to pull if the a mother chair. Not... Really? Yeah. How? So they hang him. Uh, I'll, I'll pull up the photos. Iran, mom, execution, son. Here it is. Dude, you got to see this. This is nuts. But yeah, this is the, the, the way that it's doled out. It's basically, it's saying, it, and it makes sense to me. Like, look, it doesn't make sense if the, the victim is like, oh, someone else go and kill this guy on my behalf. I feel like, you know... That's the responsibility on the individual who wants to to follow through with capital punishment. So if you see the photos, like he's standing on the chair and uh, she goes up and she slaps him and uh, apparently says, you know, I forgive you. And uh, they basically uh, they, they don't uh, carry out with the, uh, the capital punishment, um, you know, rather than having someone else, you know, do the uh, the, the actual execution. Well, if somebody else volunteered. You know... I wouldn't let a woman go and kill a guy who killed her son. Like, that's too much trauma for her, honestly. But this is the, the whole concept. Is the victim's family is the one who determines capital punishment. 
it makes sense that someone from the victim's family would be the one. And it's not like you have to go and hunt this guy down. It's like, no, the, they have him. They have him on the news. You just have to pull the, the, the lever, pull the switch, whatever, to uh, end this guy's life. I think this concept of like, you know, uh, outsourcing that to other individuals who have nothing to do with the matter. Me, I don't It doesn't sit well with me. Um, not again, if, if you see it differently, that's totally fine. It's just like, to me, it kind of makes sense that if you want to say, Hey, I want to go down the route of capital punishment. But, um, it's something you, you would have to carry out yourself and you're, you're legally and, you know, religiously authorized to be able to do that. Look, I'll tell you, like, killing somebody is not something easy, even if they deserve it. Hmm? I agree 100 percent. And I think that's the, the significance, because if God wants to in- discourage capital punishment, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, I want this guy to die. It's another thing if, oh, OK, you got to d- be the one who do it. Um, and I, th- I see this as kind of a det- uh, deterrent people to willy-nilly just say yeah just kill the guy you know hang him whatever if they don't have to be the one who actually you know does the uh, the, the 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 task i think there's real significance that it's consciously hard for someone to have to bear that yeah fair enough i agree want to know a crazy stat so prior to vietnam okay most people, like when they would fight, it was like just basically, you know, uh, hand-to-hand combat, like, you know, you're in lines and shooting at each other and stuff like that. They did all these analysis, and they were seeing how many people actually shot with the intention of killing. What they found was like over 50%, like something like 70, 80%, I can pull the actual number, shot without the intention of actually wanting to, to, to kill the other side. There was mentally, despite the fact that you're at war with these people, most people would shoot up in the air or they would go through the motions. They would, you know, kind of like make noise and stuff, but they really didn't want to hurt the other side. What's interesting is what changed uh, around the time of Vietnam is this concept of conditioning where people would basically just been told like uh, point, aim, shoot, point, aim, shoot, point, aim, shoot, like just going through this repetition to be able to kill without thinking. And one thing that's crazy is like you look at, say, for instance, these uh, 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 high school shootings and stuff like that. How is it possible that you have this, you know, predominantly teenage boys being able to go and carry out these atrocities without any real life experience and not, you know, again, fall to their knees, start crying and like, you know, losing uh, uh, um, control uh, from executing the first person, you know, that they go on these rampages. And one of the realities is when they have these first person shooter games. Is that for these sociopaths, they're literally conditioning themselves to be able to carry through with this act without having that remorse. No different than what they do in the military. You know, and that's a pretty crazy thing that, you know, we've become so desensitized that you take someone without any real life experience to be able to go through that act of taking the life of someone else and feel nothing. Um, it's it's like I'm not against, you know, first person shooter games and these kind of like video games, but it does come at a price. Ali, assalamu alaikum. What is the schedule? So, God willing, we try to meet uh, every week on Sunday at, um, depending on what time zone you are, uh, but at this uh, time, and we read some verses and then just have a discussion. And an hour into the study, so in about 15 minutes, it's just an uh, open discussion. So I just want to write, just write, take that um, point home. I really appreciated it because that's something I struggled with. It's 533. I just didn't understand. But now that I understand it's the context of war, in the context of war, you commit horrendous crimes and you can kill them. So that, again, reiterates the fact that it's, um, you know, during such a circumstance. Can I ask one more question? Sure. To take it further home. Uh, what do you think is a fair punishment for a child molester? Castration. A child molester. I would or, say cast- yeah. like, cut off. I would say personally oh. capital punishment or cut off the foot and hand on alternate sites. Other than that, what are you going to do? Go molest their child? Like the, the whole tooth for a tooth concept only has a limit, right? I mean, honestly, I would say cut off their balls. Like, that's my, 
you know, at, at a minimum, like, I feel like that's something that if you, you rape, you molest something that's like flagrant, that is, you know, there's no uh, doubt about it. In essence, okay, you've lost your sex drive. We basically nullified it. Um, I think that in essence, that's just like a, um, uh, they become a detriment to society. Dude, I'll tell you some crazy stuff that's happening in uh, California. Basically, so if you have rapists who now identify as women, they put them inside the women's prison and they're raping uh, uh, inmates. There's sexual assault cases against this, okay? If that's not crazy enough, in Los Angeles, uh, Gersetti, the mayor, he, there was a 17-year-old uh, boy rapes a 10-year-old girl, okay? When he was in his 20s, he gets charged for the crime and the defense says, hey, you know what? was a, a, a minor when this happened, so we should try him as a juvenile. They said, okay, we'll try him as a juvenile. They said, oh, you know what? He actually identifies as a female now. They said, okay, we'll basically treat him as a female. So he gets a, a sentence. They send him to the, the female juvenile prison. And this is a guy who raped children. This is the level of absurdity we're dealing with, you know? And, you know, my, my take is it's like at a minimum, dude, cut off the guy's balls. You know, nullify his sex drive. Well, it's not about his drive. Like, he still needs to be punished adequately according to the Quran, right? Um, but that's just ridiculous, identifying as a woman. <laughs> that, is that a joke? Is that real? No, no, this is real. This is real. This is like, it's one of those things that it's just, it's nuts that it doesn't get more attention. Um, you know, not to, to, to be too adjacent, but right now the, the, the top female swimmer is a dude. It's like, this is absurd. The, the woman of the year when Caitlyn Jenner came out was a dude. It's like, we've gotten to the point of such absurdity uh, regarding this, but that's that's a totally separate, sorry. Yeah, I think, I think the absurdity is obvious. However, uh, the compensation aspect of it, I think should be more looked at rather than the disfigurement of somebody. I mean, it, it seems like the right thing, but it doesn't, it, that doesn't solve the compensation aspect of it. And, and, uh, even if somebody's that happens to them, what does that, how does that affect them in carrying out that compensation? Uh, so I don't know about that. I don't think there is a compensation, but what's most important is that person cannot do it again, right? Whatever you punish me, you dull out has to prevent them from ever being able to do it, regardless of their desire or their drive or whatever. That is that really the case? I mean, even like when you mark the hand of somebody who steals, are you have you prevented them from doing it? Well, the Saudis say, yeah, you chop the hand off, or whatever. Then yeah, he's prevented from grabbing it and taking it. Well, that's not what we see. I don't see the the prevention of them from doing it again. More of the it's more of the social stigma of somebody who has the mark of a st uh, somebody who stole. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think the mercy here is getting a little bit uh, clouded uh, in for the uh, for in 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 the in the attempt to prevent in the attempt to uh, to control it. You know, there's I don't know. I, it doesn't sit right with. Me. It's worth pointing out that you know the vast majority of punishments aren't uh, de decreed in the Quran, and I feel like the the reason for that. It's because these are things that God has given us the discretion to decide, okay, what is most uh, suitable. Um, so I, I would be apprehensive to make some sort of blanket uh, rule per se. But, um, you know, uh, I think there's significance that when you look at the, uh, the, the, the punishments in the Quran, really limited. Uh, you have the capital punishment in the sense of uh, for death. You have uh, uh, someone who steals. You have a, a adultery. Um, I, I don't think there's much more uh, other than that that's specifically mentioned what the uh, the punishment is in the, uh, the the Quran. I'm just saying there's something in common between them, like adultery, 100 lashes is in public, right? But everybody can see who this person is. He's not going to fool anyone else that he's innocent anymore. Somebody who gets their hand marked, their testimony in court is worthless now. When they put up their hand, everybody knows this person is a thief. Yeah, yeah, I think that the, the social aspect of it is uh, it's really powerful. There's it's awesome. There was this judge. He was a juvenile court judge. And the uh, punishment he would have the kids do is basically like if they stole something, 
they would go and hold a sign in front of that store saying, you know, I stole such and such from the store and they had to stay there all day. <laughs> and it's like the, the aspect is at the end of the day, you want to have uh, restitution. You want to basically uh, in, instill on the person not to commit the crime again. Um, and at the same time, how do you put it? You don't want someone's worst day to be a defining aspect of their entire life at the same time. Uh, and this is different than, say, for instance, like you have these uh, repeat offenders and stuff like that. Um, but uh, if someone just made a dumb move one day, you know, and just like, uh, in essence, has to regret that their whole life. There's these cases. Um, some guy is basically with his wife. Someone is hitting on his wife. He punches the guy. The guy falls over, hits his head and dies. You know, uh, and it's like thinks you, you would never think you'd be in a situation like that. And uh, I think there is a real merit in kind of uh, not trying to uh, blanket uh, one size fits all kind of uh, punishments across the board. But at the same time, yeah, it's worth contemplating like, OK, under you know specific si situations, what are some uh, adequate uh, punishments that uh, fit the crime? Yeah, I've got those talk about killing a believer versus non-believer even. Yeah, on purpose. Yeah. One of the, the aspects that I just think of is the, uh, uh, in Surah 5, it discusses uh, the, the breaking of oaths and the, uh, the requirement to fast. I'm just thinking, I'm like, man, I, I, <laughs> I need to spend the rest of my life fasting. Because um, I always put that off, you know, I try to make some self-justification for why, oh, you know, it wasn't an oath, it was this, it was that. I feel like if we actually applied these uh, these rules, it would keep us a lot more on the uh, the, the straight and narrow. Um, yeah, I agree, because people throw out promises that they don't really care about keeping, because nobody fasts. But I feel like any any oath you make, you should fast for it if you break it. That's good for you. <laughs> it's like, you know what's funny is uh, they actually, this is one of the, the, the strongest kind of uh, deterrents. If someone had 100% certainty, they would get caught. The, the, the reason most people commit uh, the vast majority of the crimes is because they think that they're not going to get caught. They think that, hey, look, I did this 100 times. You know, it's not going to happen, so they'll do it. Um, they did some stat regarding drunk driving, and I can't remember. They said, look, for everyone we catch for uh, drunk driving, statistically, we calculate there was probably 100 incidents before uh, this one where they got caught. You know? and, but if you knew for sure, and this is like God's system, you know for sure that if you transgress these laws, you're going to be uh, reprimanded for it. It's a lot easier to keep people on the, uh, the, the, the straight and narrow. It's this aspect that, again, we kind of deceive ourselves. Say God is most gracious, God is most merciful, he, he'll forgive me this time. <laughs> but if we knew with absolute certainty, no, you're going to pay the price, like just don't do it. I, I think it would make us uh, able to, to maintain righteousness a lot better. Yeah, I, I agree. I think with a lot of things, you, God is merciful, you know, you can repent. But with a few things, there is a specific punishment you need to carry out, right? Like the hundred lashes the three-day fast, the marking of the hand. Um, there are some things that you actually need to do something. I have a thought regarding the, uh, the marking of the hands. I'm curious what you guys think. Um, equate the mark to kind of the severity of the, 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 the crime, right? Like a child who steals something, you know, obviously isn't going to be held as responsible Let's say an extreme example, Bernie Madoff, who, you know, uh, basically conned people out of billions of dollars. Um, and I feel like those punishments between the two should be commensurate. So, like, if hypothetically, you know, a child goes into a store, steals a lollipop of some sort, you know, the, the mark on the hand might be just like, look, I'm going to get a, a permanent marker, a mark in your hand, just so you can remember, like, look, this is not what we do, you know, uh, versus, again, someone who uh, uh, is a repeat offender, um, you know, th that the the distinction should be in my opinion more more visible yeah i agree it makes sense i think for for a child like as long as you cannot say like like when it comes to them like i don't know if you 
but this is my personal opinion, but I, I wouldn't mark the hand of like a 10 year old child who stole a chocolate bar at the store. If you did it in the sense like a permanent marker, right? It's like, look, this is just like a reminder. This is not what we do. So, you know, you have that that shame for that time being, but it's like, okay, you know, Different. you know, week the, yeah. the mark is gone. Um, I think there's, you know, there's merit in that sense, like the, the public exposure uh, bearing that guilt uh, is like one of the, the, the aspects. Same thing, like adultery is like a good example of this. You know, it's, it's one thing that it's like, look, society recognizes that you've done this act. And it's hopefully to keep people, again, uh, more conscientious. You look, a lot of the, the punishments in life aren't written laws, right? They're, they're social norms. Uh, when a society tolerates certain actions, and in essence, it just becomes chaos. Like what's crazy is in San Francisco, you know, people walk into the uh, uh, Walgreens and stuff. They load up bags and they just walk out. And the brazenness of this has just gotten to a whole new level. Uh, over uh, just the other day, I doesn't just walk into the store and steal off the shelves. He literally walks behind the counter and starts stocking up on everything and just walks out. But no one does anything because they basically have discussed that, hey, culturally, we allow people to do this. And if you try to stop this person, you're going to be held liable. This is just like, it, it's so fundamentally broken. You know, a society that tolerates this kind of behavior, that there is no social stigma against doing it. All you're doing is you're inviting more of this kind of uh, uh, destructive acts into your uh, society. Yeah, I'm sure. um, It's good to let a kid know that what the punishment is or or something like that. Like I do, I do like the idea of like a permanent marker where they have to look at it for a week. Mashallah is very interesting. Seeing if I can find that video. it's like a, i think there's real value in the sense like as a submitter society that we we raise the uh, the the bar of what is uh socially uh acceptable and we basically promote uh morality uh, the term that uh, god used in the quran is maruf you know maruf is something that's universally recognized as good and you know uh, uh equitable um when a society just tolerates all kinds of vice and disgusting acts, doesn't like frown upon it, is, you know, not just tolerant, but they're uh, condoning of it. They promote it. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's a downward spiral. You look at like SF, they have a population of 800,000 people. Some like 30,000 people are like homeless. Uh, they have open uh, drug scenes. And you just see these videos of basically people walking down the street and it's like people are like convulsing right on the side of the street, shooting up and doing all kinds of chaos. This has just become, you know, acceptable uh, behavior. Yeah, I, I, I'm even more further than that. It's like, for me, like, uh, the world really, it, it, it all goes to chaos the day good people stand by and do nothing. Like, we should also oppose these things actively. Yeah, there's a quote. It's a Rabbi uh, Abraham Herschel. He was like a civil rights uh, 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 activist during uh, uh, Martin Luther King. He had this quote I really like. It says, uh, "Few are guilty, but all are responsible." It's like you know, if we just stand by and we don't say anything, we just like turn a blind eye, we we disregard this and that. It's like at a certain point, people are just going to think that okay, this is the way that society needs to be. Um, I think a, a cool use case is you look at um, uh, graffiti. They see, like, if you allow graffiti to be up, uh, eventually it just overtakes the city. Um, but if you show that it's like, look, the second graffiti goes up, we're going to basically paint over it. You show that, look, the society doesn't tolerate this kind of destruction to property. And um, it, it's, it's interesting. It sets that kind of, like, precedent in the society. I think really has a... Uh, an effect on the people because that's kind of dictating okay what what do we tolerate uh here um and most people they just kind of fall along whatever the norm is i don't know if you guys seen this video i have a bunch of people waiting to like for a uh um, interview of some sort so they're in a waiting room and then 
they'll spontaneously ring a bell and basically everyone except for the the the, the person who enters in the room are actors simultaneously everyone stands up and then when the bell rings they sit back down okay and so they watch and they see, okay, every new person who comes in, they just see, okay, when the bell rings, everyone stands up, so they stand up. Then they start replacing each person in the room with new people who, again, aren't actors, they're real participants. Again, eventually they filled the entire waiting room with new people who all, when the bell rings, they all stand up and then they sit down. <laughs> and it just goes to show like, how much of an impact. Let's see if I can find this. Uh, it's really funny. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, no, there's definitely an influence happening. And, and the thing is, like, I, with every generation or every 10 years, what was considered unacceptable 20, 30 years ago, today, like, we've become desensitized to it and it's become normal. And, and like, mm -hmm. that's when you allow things to exist in your society. Eventually, they get incorporated into the, into the normal everyday style. Like. Mm-hmm. And this is the, uh, like close by, uh, mentioned the ash conformity uh, experiment. This one's like really funny. They have a, uh, again, a whole room of actors and then one person who's actually the experiment's being conducted on. And they would have like these simple questions. So they would show them a, a slide and then they'd say, okay, which one was the right answer? And most, they're super like basic, straightforward. And a couple questions in, you know, everyone's giving the right answers. Then a couple questions in, they'll show three lines. And then they'll basically take the picture away. And they'll say, okay, which line was the shortest? Was it A, B, or C? And everyone in the room starts giving their answer. And then it finally gets to the person who the experiment's being conducted on. And everyone else in the room gave the wrong answer. The question was, was that person in the room, are they going to go with the crowd? Or basically say, no, you know, they say A, but it was actually C. What they find is like some 60 plus percent of people basically just go with what the crowd uh, said in that in essence they conform to whatever uh, the uh, the majority even if they saw with their own eyes that they were wrong um, what was funny was they did a spin on this experiment and they brought in so they you basically have a a, a room of confederates these are people who are in on the experiment mm -hmm. have the participant who doesn't know that he's the only individual being tested and uh, they go through the same line of experimentation. They they show these questions, and then basically they, uh, the the whole class gives the answer. One thing they did is they brought someone into the experiment just a few minutes late. This guy has like Coke bottle glasses and stuff, and they say he says I can't, you know, I can't participate in this experiment because technically, like, I can't see the board. They said, don't worry, just just sit down and try your best, right? But when they get to that question, where again they they show uh, the, which line is the shortest everyone gives the wrong answer then they go to the guy with the coke bottle glasses again he's in on the experiment and rather than giving the same answer as everyone else he gives a different wrong answer what was funny was just by that mere presence of this individual giving the wrong answer even though technically he couldn't see the board it was enough kind of a uh, um, support for the 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 person who the experiment was being conducted upon to give the right answer you know, a lot of times, I feel like in a society, we want everyone to think and feel and everything the same. Uh, the, the reality is, it's like it's good to have dissenting voices because sometimes, you know, we might all be just conforming to what we think what other people want us to say. So, you know, it's a, it's a good, good reminder in that sense that we don't, mm -hmm. social pressure could be used for good or it could just be destructive. Uh, thanks for the time. I, I gotta get back to work. So I like want to put it. I don't remember if this is in the the link I sent. Oh, okay, so this is brain games. There's another one where they do a, a rendition of this uh, experiment. So they bring someone into a waiting room, and uh, basically they just start filling the room with smoke. And what they wanted to do see is if everyone else was just sitting there, not uh, pretend, you know, acting like not panicked. Uh, how much smoke would the room fill before that individual basically goes and, you know, runs out or says something or does something? More often than not, people look for cues from other people. They're in the room, it's getting filled with smoke, and uh, they're, they're panicked, but they're looking at everyone else. No one else seems to mind, so they just kind of sit around. What's crazy is there was actually a fire that this happened to. This was like, a, say, like the early 1900s. It was this like a, a ball, everyone was dressed up, and, you know, they saw the, the smoke coming, but because no one was panicking, everyone just kind of continued sitting around. 
And, you know, I think like a couple hundred people ended up dying from this. Um, so a lot of times we just look for cues from the, uh, the, the, the people around us. If we see they're not panicking, we don't panic. You know? And it's hard to be that lone voice saying, hey, guys, there's a freaking fire. It's getting filled with smoke. We need to get up and leave. Yeah, the human is a social being. The, the sad thing is it can lead, you know, if the, the, the majority of people, if everyone is oblivious, right, then you don't realize that the room is full of smoke. And you take Sodom and Gomorrah, where everyone is just such heinous, disgusting individuals, it's easy to discard what uh, Lot is telling them. If there were more sensible people in this community... You know, it kind of pushes. It's crazy how small of a group can have such an oversized impact on a society. Um, we had a Quran study last night and we we're talking about, uh, you know, the what's going on in Russia and Ukraine and this and that. The reality is like, look, we have no there's nothing we can say or do regarding that situation that's going to make any sort of impact. The one thing we can do that can guarantee literally like geo um, uh, political impact is leading a righteous life. Consider if it wasn't for Lot and his family, you know, the, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah probably would have been wiped out a long time ago. If we can just maintain righteousness, that literally God will preserve an entire nation, God will preserve an entire people uh, for the sake of those uh, few righteous individuals. This is something that it's like, it's hard to think like how me being a, uh, a righteous individual could have effects in Russia and Ukraine, but it does because God protects the believers that if we do the things that uh, uh pleasing to god that god will create a bubble around us and make sure that these you know uh these um uh consequences of the uh, the devil aren't going to impact you know um our uh our well-being there's a uh psalm uh, 99 in the, uh, the 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 Bible. It's so powerful. It says, "The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the uh, cherubim, and let the earth shake." Uh, let me see. Is this? Oh, not 99. Psalm 91. Sorry. It says, "Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust." Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. He fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked, if you say, my Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will, be, uh, the, you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. He acknowledges my name. I will call on me. Uh, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, if, if we do the things that God uh, expects from us, you know, we're guaranteed God's protection. This is something that it's like it's more valuable than anything else, you know, any other precaution we can take. The, the the best precaution any human being can have. So we're past the, uh, the, the hour mark. Um, we can open it up to a more general discussion if anyone wants to bring up anything regarding the uh, uh, verses of the Quran or, uh, you know, questions.
Mantha, I, I saw that. Wanted to, yeah. I just wanted to reiterate one point and concerning vengeance versus uh, forgiveness that the difficult things to do are placed in the responsibility of the believers. It's a very difficult thing to, to forgive. Vengeance is a baser form. And I think that uh, that's kind of the general principle that should be viewed with a lot of these things. In the case of a, a woman uh, needing to be the, the actual one pulling the trigger, I think uh, there's a question of whether forgiveness is happening. Like somebody may kill somebody simply because they're afraid they'll do it again. You know, and and that muddies the distinction of when somebody is uh, coming from a place of forgiveness uh, or vengeance or fear. And I think those distinctions matter and kind of play a role in determining these things. And I think also that principle, uh, it's your right, but we're trying to go to heaven. If you're if you're somebody who's a believer and you're applying all these laws and rules to yourself, you're trying to become admitted back into heaven and that situation of forgiveness is a, is going to be a great opportunity to add to your record praise god anyone else have any uh, comments or questions or topics Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum. So, I guess um, I don't really know how to like word the question, but my I don't know dilemma is when I'm in the masjid and there's and like there's people asking me if I'm Sunni or or whichever. I don't really know how to like address myself or explain to them like that I just follow the Quran alone. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I was saying. I think I was asking something about, like, what is a submitter like? I know what a submitter is, but how do I explain that to, like, someone else who's, who, like, categorizes themselves as, like, a Sunni or something different? Mm -hmm. I think you, you nailed it. You know, you follow the Quran alone. You worship God alone. Um, it's kind of the, 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 the foundation of uh, uh, our uh, belief. Um, there's a verse in the Quran, 262 and uh, 569. It basically says, uh, Surely those who believe, those who are Jewish, the Christians, the converts, anyone who, one, believes in God, two, believes in the last day, and three, leads a righteous life, will receive their recompense from their Lord, and nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. But these are the requirements necessary that if someone fulfills this, by definition, they're a, a submitter. Um, and it's actually is an opportunity to spark the conversation when people ask you, to, you know, you say, oh, I follow the Quran alone. You know, what what do you mean by that? And you can basically engage with them. They probably won't like your responses, but who knows? Maybe the God directs the right people uh, who are receptive to this, who see the the uh, insanity that is spewed from, you know, following these other uh, uh, teachings. Um, I think the, the answer you're giving is, is the correct one. I don't know if anyone else has any uh, thoughts on that. Uh, the light close by uh, asked the question. So in 548 says, when we revealed to you the scripture truthfully confirming previous scriptures and superseding them, you shall rule among them in accordance with God's revelations and do not follow their wishes if they defer that the truth that has come to you. It says, for each of you, we have decreed laws and different rights. God willed he could have made you one congregation, but he thus puts you to the test through the revelations he has given each of you. You shall compete in righteousness to God is your final destiny, all of you. Then he will inform you of everything you had disputed. 2128, our Lord, make us submitters to you, and from our descendants, let there be a community of submitters to you. Teach us the rights of our religion and redeem us, your Redeemer, most merciful. Uh, my understanding is that, yeah, if you look at the children of Israel, the, the rights that they had, and let's say, for instance, like the Sabbath, um, it no longer applies to us. The dietary prohibitions they have is different than what we have. Um, that God gave them 
a, a, a scripture with their rights. And if they're choosing not to follow the Quran, then they're responsible for upholding the uh, the the rights of what they have. Um, that's that's my understanding. Um, I don't know if anyone has any uh, anything else they want to add to that. Yeah, you can see it in the uh, Surah 5, in uh, verses 40 through 48. Every people of the scripture needs to follow their own book. They need to, if, if they don't follow the other one, they need to follow their own one, strictly. God alone, God's words alone, as a source. I just want to comment on this real quick. I think that I think there was really good comments said, but basically, um, <clears throat> this is basically our religion is you know we're submitters to God alone. You know, I think the difference is uh, sectarianism is condemned in the world, right? So we're not allowed to be a part of any sect. We actually have to emphasize this and go out of our way to make sure that we reiterate this point that look, we're not interested in any sectarianism. We literally only accept. Title provided by us in the Quran, forty-one thirty-three. I'm sorry, is it? Yeah, forty-one thirty-three. That um, this is the best thing you can call yourself is a submitter to God. So, if you're submitted to God and you follow Quran alone, then I think that's the best. Uh, I can't think of a better title for the Shias and the Sunnis. They can get in their you know sectarianism, but as far as we're concerned, you know, we deal only in what you know God being does. I guess. Any other uh, comments or questions or topics that anyone wants to, uh, to to bring up to discuss? Assalamu alaikum. I have an off-topic question of course. Um, about uh, the uh, book that Moses received. So we know that it's not the Torah, right? Because that's um, in a footnote. Um, God willing, I'll find the footnote. It says something like, uh, I don't recall actually, sorry. But um, yeah, so what book did he get? Hey, go ahead. I was just going to say, this is a very common misnomer, misconception that he got the Torah. He actually didn't get the Torah. The Torah is a collection of all the books prior to the arrival of Jesus. Um, so uh, what Moses did get, and he got with Aaron together, is a statute book. Um, and that's not the Torah. And so if anyone tells you that Moses got the Torah, just ask them, hey, show me the verse in the Quran where it says Moses got the Torah, because there is no such verse. So the collection of all the books of the children of Israel and the prophets um, that constitutes the Torah. So it includes the Psalms and a bunch of other books. Does that answer the uh, the question, Katarina? Yeah, I guess. But the footnote is in twenty eight forty three. So it says. Um, the Torah is the collection of all the scriptures revealed to all the prophets of Israel, including the book of Moses. So is that something else, right? That's not what Moses was given. If I'm understanding that footnote correctly. I believe so. I believe uh, all we know is that God describes as the uh, Forkan, right? The, the statute book, uh, the book of law. Uh, that this is what was given to, uh, to to Moses when it uses the context of the uh, Torah, that this is the collection of all the uh, the scriptures that were given to the uh, children of Israel. Okay, so we don't know exactly what the statute book is that was given to him. It's, so it's definitely not the Old Testament. It was something before that, right? So I would personally I'm, say the first five books, 
something like the first five books of the Old Testament are the books that are typically associated with Moses. So Genesis, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Yeah, the aspect of it is like it, it talks about Moses' death. You know, there are obviously uh, deviations from what we know to be uh, true in these uh, books. Yeah, you know, the, the common understanding is that these five books uh, within that is contained what was given to uh, to Moses. There's a, another question from the light close by. It says, if the description of uh, afterlife are all allegorical, is it true that hell being a fire is also allegorical? Surely those who disbelieve in our revelations, we will condemn them to the hellfire wherein their skins are burnt. Give them new skins. Thus, they will suffer continuously. God is almighty, most wise. Does this contradict 456, which says that the skins will be burnt, or can we assume this is also allegorical? My, my take is this is all allegorical. You know, if you wanted to tell someone that, look, this is the worst pain and suffering you can imagine, you know, you use these kind of terms to uh, convey that point. What's fascinating is I was listening to a couple talks with uh, people who suffered both, uh, you know, a ton of uh, physical uh, torture and pain, and then also depression. And they said the depression was 10x worse than any physical pain that they suffered. The context is it's hard to convey that you know, without talking about something physical. And, you know, imagine your whole, for all of eternity, you have to reminisce on this fact that you blew this last chance you had. And uh, you have to live with that shame, that that depression, you know, that's far greater than any physical pain a person can feel. What's crazy is like you take someone in solitary confinement, one of the, the things that they say is the most debilitating of that is that sensory deprivation fact that you you know they say you you bleed just to know you're alive that pain in context to isolation and loneliness and depression is a uh, uh, a a better state than being in that uh that you know uh, uh, abyss and I, I think of it in the same way when it comes to the uh, the descriptions of heaven and hell these are all purely allegorical for us to try to get a grasp of just how good it is and or how miserable it is and I think verse 226 clarifies and makes very clear that the, out, the uh, examples given for heaven and hell are uh, allegories. So we don't have any doubt about the fact that these are all allegory. So I agree with Peter on this, that all of these descriptions are all allegorical. You know, one of the uh, critiques that you hear, this is predominantly from atheists, they say, oh, you know, why is God... Uh, talking about, you know, people's skin being burned off and this and that. And I, I think about it, it says, God does not shy away from any allegory, be it as small as a mosquito or greater. I think you go into a doctor's office, okay? And let's say you've just been living a very unhealthy life. If you don't exercise, you, you sleep like terribly, uh, you eat a bunch of junk food, and then, you, you know, you, the doctor's like, look, dude, you continue this lifestyle. You're going to get diabetes. They might have to amputate your arms and legs and your feet, you know? And uh, no one's going to walk out of the doctor's office and be like, dude, that doctor was a jerk. How dare he tell me this stuff? <laughs> it's like the aspect is we look at the doctor to be the, the, the source of truth, to be upfront with us, to not lie to us, to tell us exactly what we should expect. You know, God in the same light is trying to, he's the only one who can be direct with us. You know, how would you feel going and telling your friends and family that, hey, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you're going to suffer for all of eternity. You're going to seem like a jerk. Like, how dare you say that to me? When they hear it from their creator, the Lord of the universe, it's one of those things that it's like, if God wasn't forthcoming with this information and wasn't direct with people, you know, on the day of judgment, they'd be like, why didn't you tell us how bad this is? It's like, it describes it in the most horrendous ways. So there's no doubt in people's mind that, look, you continue down this, you know, the, the, the path of straying, the consequences are going to be severe more severe than you can imagine and uh it's out of god's mercy that he tells us this you know how messed up would it be if it was never disclosed that there's a hell and you know people go and live these horrendous lives of sin and then they're like suffering for all of eternity Um, could these allegories refer to, um, like, reincarnation or something? 
I mean, in a sense, there is reincarnation, but it's not, you don't reincarnate back into this life. <laughs> you reincarnate into the hereafter. And the decisions you make in this life are going to determine your eternity in the hereafter. Yeah, like, um, like any like concept of like, let's say your soul being born into like uh, different, different bodies. Like, uh, could this refer to like some type of emotional, um, like the allegories, could they be like emotional or like, like that? Like your soul is reborn over and over again, and that's like yeah. kind of miserable. I don't know. Have you ever been in a situation where it's like you so uh, devastating that you couldn't sleep at night, that you wake up in you know the middle of the night and you have a cold sweat throughout the entire day? It's just like you're just in you know this this emotional anguish. Um, you know whatever it is that you're dealing. Uh, I see it in the same way, but rather than this being a temporary thing like it is in this life, you know, in the hereafter, that that feeling is going to stay with the individual for all of eternity. And there's no um, relief from it. You know, there's no, hey, time heals all wounds and this and that. It's like, no, not in that case. Um, I, I, I see this all in the sense like, you know, whatever the, 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 the pain, the, the retribution, the suffering is far greater than you know could even be described in these kindly uh, kind of uh, worldly uh, uh, ways. But it's worth pointing out that God doesn't send anyone to hell. This is an active decision that people make to go to hell, which seems very peculiar. Like, why would anyone choose to go to hell? The, the the thing is, each time we make a decision to sin, to, to go away from God, to basically uh, go towards things that are destructive for our souls, we're making a vote that we want to go to hell. Um, and then on the day of judgment, you know, at that point, it's like people, in essence, one of the, 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 the flaws they're going to have, they're never going to be able to uh, recognize that they were the ones at fault. Take the example of Satan, you know. Satan goes and defies God, and rather than saying, hey, you know, God, I'm wrong, sorry, forgive me, allow me back in. No, he doubles down. You know, he genuinely thinks his uh, uh, deepest thoughts that he's the one who's in the right. If someone never acknowledges that they're doing something wrong, that they're committing sin, they're never going to repent, never going to reform. It says, God says in the Quran, even if we send them back a thousand times, they're going to commit the same sins over and over again. It's like until you, you, and this is our last chance, until we really learn our lesson and genuinely, you know, reform back on the, the right path, this is it, you know, this, this could determine uh, or this will determine the rest of our uh, uh, eternity. asking about reincarnation because like there are a lot of um religions uh that have this concept of reincarnation so i was wondering where they got it from and whether heaven or hell in the quran could refer to that in an allegorical way i think when they use the the term reincarnation they're talking about like in this life right different religions and stuff they'll say oh you'll come in a different animal or a different life different person one thing i would say though I, I, I don't think it's far-fetched, is you do have these accounts of people, like there's this really interesting one, that, you know, I wouldn't believe if it wasn't for the amount of like research and uh, 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 supporting studies they did to like validate that, okay, this is real. As a kid, he was born, and then when he's like five years old, he's infatuated with planes. And uh, he had all this information about planes. They're like, dude, how are you learning this? And not only that, had like intricate understandings of like the the mechanics and even how to make napalm they're like how does a five-year-old even know what napalm is let alone how to make napalm and so he he claimed that he's like i don't know it, this is the, the the kid that he was a um, world war ii uh, pilot and he was shot down and he actually gave the name of the uh who he was before the name of the lieutenant in charge and the name of the ship that he was on they went and they confirmed and all this came out as true. They actually went and visited that person's family. And they're saying like the way the child was describing it says, look, I have a tough time. And he's like, in his, uh, at least the, the, when he visited the family, he's like he was in his teenagers. He says, I have a tough time distinguishing my you know, memories from this other entity. Like my take is it's, uh, you know, when we die, when we're living, we have two parts of us. We have the soul and we have the jinn, the companion. And when we die, though, the companion still continues living. I'm just thinking no different than you see some kids who are, you know, uh, born in a uh, uh, retarded or like, you know, mentally deficient or some, you know, uh, 
a uh, formed uh, manner. This is a similar thing where it's almost like this guy's jinn companion got fused. Like, you know, imagine that the signals that are for this individual's memory got fused with this poor kid's memory. Now he can't determine which one is his memories, which one is this other entity's memories. It's funny, someone looks at this story and they say, oh, this is proof of reincarnation. Oh, this, you know, uh, World War II veteran who died, he came back as this child. And I, I think of it as like, no, I don't think that's what's happening. I think the, the memories of this individual got fused somehow with this poor kid. It's just leading him to the point of just not being able to dis distinguish his own memories from this, like the remnants of this other guy's. Would someone who, um, like, let you know, let's say someone says they received, uh, like scripture or something, um, and someone believes them and they, uh, let's say start following what they're saying, and like, let's say somebody was following the Quran and then somebody else says that they got new scripture and they follow them, and they're what they say is different from the Quran, like, you know, um, that there are no uh, prayers and this and that but that person believes that they're telling the truth and whatever they're saying so would you guys say that they're like they went astray or like they're disbelievers or something like they were let's say following the quran and then now they're following a later scripture that they believe is new the, the way i see it is okay we have one mechanism that is going to be our gauge to being either, either gravitating towards the, the truth or falsehood. If we're sincere, we're going to be gravitating towards the truth, meaning when we see the truth, when we see God's message, it's as if we recognize them like we recognize our own children. If we are insincere, we live an impure life, we're going to gravitate towards falsehood and basically these uh, going astray individuals who are gravitating towards something that we know contradicts the Quran, that we know are uh, uh, destructive in this life and in the hereafter, I actually see this as a uh, uh, as kind of a, a sign that they're being insincere, they're being impure. Uh, one of the tales of this is they say, uh, I got to pull up the verse, it says that this is um, during the time of war at the Prophet's time, it says the ones who turn back on their heels this was in, indicative of the sins they committed. Meaning that the fact that they committed sins meant that they weren't able to face this challenge and fulfill this test. When someone is gravitating towards something that's clearly, you know, falsehood, just see this as an imperfection in the person's soul that is self-inflicted. If all of a sudden we see the truth and we reject it, this means that we don't deserve the truth. And if we see the path of falsehood and we adopt it, that shows that we have this, like, uh, this, um, good. But, you know, some things are, like, not, you know, it's kind of, for example, there are some other religions that came after the Quran that, like, um, like, I don't know, if somebody were to convert to the, that religion, and the religion isn't really, like, uh, like, they basically say that, oh, there's no such thing as a prayer and stuff, but they, the message itself is, like, let's say, to worship God alone, but the, the, some specific things about the religion are, um, different, like, how would, like, you know, how would someone, because, you know, also, some people might be afraid of rejecting new revelations and scriptures and whatnot, so how would somebody deal with that, like, if they fear rejecting a, a new scripture, and they follow it, but let's say that person was lying to them. Like, wh what would? Okay. These are the, the verses. Um, it says, those to whom we have given the scripture recognize this as they recognize their own children. Imagine if I say, for instance, you know, you don't have kids, but let's say your mom. Someone goes and puts an imposter in place of your mom and says, hey, this is your mom now. You'd be like, no, it's not. What are you talking about? Get out of here. I know who my mom is, right? Same thing, like imagine if you have kids, you recognize your kids. Like God has put this love in our heart that when we see our kids, like, you know, our heart flutters. Uh, we have this, this un, you know, shaking conviction. Yes, this is my child. 
all of a sudden someone swaps out my child with someone else and says, hey, this is your kid. You're going to be like, dude, get out of here. What are you talking about? This isn't my kid, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with the truth. That when, we, when we're when we sincere, when, you know, we basically do the, the things that please God, and these are things that are universally recognized as righteous, it will direct us towards the truth. In that someone who's gravitating towards falsehood, towards, you know, uh, uh, faulty messengers and scriptures and just this other kind of like nonsense inspirations from the devil, that this is just reflective that they're they're insincere, that they've they've done severe damage to their souls. So for instance, in 3.155, this is the verse I was talking about, it says, Surely those among you who turn back the days the two armies clash have been duped by the devil. And it says, this reflects some of the evil works they had committed. God has pardoned them, God is forgiver clement. Meaning the fact that they turned away was a sign that they were basically uh, uh, hurting their souls prior to that event. We didn't come to the message because we're smart, we're so sophisticated, we're so intelligent. No, the only reason we come to the message is because God saw some good in us. You know, God saw that, okay, there is some hint of individual who's genuinely trying to become righteous. Because of that, God made the message shine for us. That when we saw it, we just gravitate towards it. Someone who's spent their life, you know, uh, tarnishing and corroding their soul, even when they see the light, they won't accept it. But when they see the path of straying, they'll accept it. And this is in 7.146. It says, I will divert from my revelations those who are arrogant on earth without justification. Consequently, when they see every kind of proof, they will not believe. When they see the path of guidance, they will not adopt it as their path. When they see the path of straying, they will adopt it as their path. This is the consequence of their rejecting our proofs and being totally heedless thereof. If, if, we, if you see someone going astray, and they're not only going astray, but they're gravitating towards that path, it's, it's reflective of what their soul is actually, uh, the, the, the truth of their soul. If you see someone who's gravitating towards God's message, who's basically, you know, uh, following the path of the, uh, the, the righteous, this is indicative that, okay, there's something good in this individual's soul. What message are you talking about? Like, to worship God alone? Yeah, yeah to worship God alone, to, to follow the Quran alone, to not what set up any partners next to God. What if the new, uh, what if the person who claims to receive a new scripture, what if their message is also to worship God alone? The, the, this is the thing, uh, you know, the devil's very crafty in the sense of how he portrays this. He knows if he comes and says, hey, go worship a statue, people aren't going to do it. He uses the banner of God alone, Quran alone. But the, at the end of the day, you have to say like, okay, is this person genuinely using the Quran to justify their stance or are they using their own opinion to basically push their understanding? Like, you know, I've come across hundreds of these false messengers. They flood uh, my inbox. What's funny is at the end, they say, okay, what's your message? What is it that you're trying to say? And it's always in the sense of like, look, what you have to do is reject all this other stuff. You have to follow my interpretations, my understandings. And that's, you know, their their supposed message. And to me, it's like, you know, God has a system that the, the person who comes, not only do they have to uh, preach the, the worship of God alone to uh, uh, preach the, the Quran alone, they can't contradict the Quran. They can't contradict the, the uh, teachings of the previous messengers. You know, if they're only coming to say, look, I'm here to clean up the mess of the previous messengers, that seems very strange. You know, it doesn't uh, correspond with any of the examples we have in the Quran. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any they want to add to, to that. What's crazy is every single time God sends a, a prophet or a messenger, we see this influx of people coming to basically say, oh, they too are God's messengers or prophets, you know. And uh, it's just, I see this as a kind of a land grab. They want to be people of authority. They want to be the one who everyone is looking to, who's gravitating to, who have, you know, uh, unquestionable submission to whatever they decree. And uh, I see this more of a sense of narcissism than I do in the sense of, uh, um, you know, genuine sincerity. Not to say that God can't send the messenger. Of course he can. Just at least the people I've come across, just like I, I have a hard time seeing them in the sense of something that's uh, uh, not inspired by the devil.
I would just add that consider the type of proofs that uh, like Jesus brought, like Moses brought, like like uh, the mathematical miracle. These are extraordinary. the The impact is is incredible. I mean, it's a, it, they're they're large proofs. They're not subtle, and uh, that's what we were told also, is that God's proofs are not subtle. The one thing that's funny is like a, <laughs> there's one guy that he's been claiming to be a messenger for a number of years now, and I just see how he's constantly trying to like reform how he presents it or discusses it to kind of eliminate these uh, contradictions that he was called out for before. And uh, his latest tactic is he just says, everyone is right. So in essence, it's like no one basically can say, oh, he's contradicting or this and that. He just says, everything is right. Oh, you want to interpret? Okay, that's that's fine. So it's just, it's interesting that they, they're so uh, conniving in the sense of how to kind of like wiggle their way in um, to try to uh, wash any kind of this uh, dissent. At the end of the day, it's like one commonality I just see consistently is they make themselves the focus. You know, it's never the 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 Quran, the message, God. It's always them, them, them. Like, oh, here, come to me. I will tell you all the uh, right answers. And uh, you know, rarely is it uh, using actually the uh, the 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 verses of the Quran uh, to 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 make their uh, their their points. Anything uh, else anyone wants to, to, to bring up? Shall the light close by, put some uh, good verses. Uh, 870, O you prophet, tell the prisoners of war in your hands. If God knew of anything good in your hearts, he would have given you better than anything you have lost. He would have forgiven you. God is forgiver, most merciful. 3126, God thus informs you in order to give you good news and to assure your hearts. Victory comes only from God, the Almighty, most wise. 6112, we have permitted the enemies of every prophet Human and jinn devils to inspire in each other fancy words in order to deceive. Had your uh, Lord willed, they would not have done it. You shall disregard them and their fabrications. Eighteen fifty-seven. Who are more evil than those who are reminded of their Lord's proofs and disregard them without? Realizing what they are doing, consequently we place shields on their hearts to prevent them from understanding it. Quran and deafness in their ears. Thus, no matter what you do to guide them, they can never be guided. Yeah, Matt, do you want to uh, uh, comment? Free to, uh, to chime in. Uh, Ahmed made a good point um, to Nancy. He says, No other book can replicate the Quran. It is a proven scripture. Some other book may call to worship one God, but it will need to provide proof of it being from God. Someone produced something like that, uh, the Quran. Like, um, if someone says there is a new scripture, like, do you think I would have to go and study it and try to figure out if there are any proofs in it? And, um, like, let's say somebody says I got a whole bunch of uh, revelations, a whole bunch of, uh, like, a big scripture. Would I have to basically study it um, deeply to figure out if there are proofs in it or not? I would so yeah so this is a good verse thirty four forty four we did not give them any other book to study nor uh, we sent to them before you another warner I'd say regarding this though is the fact that God says that the Quran is the final scripture when it says that uh, Muhammad is Khatam al uh, uh, Nabi that he's basically the the the, the final prophet 
means that there isn't going to be another scripture that's going to come. But, you know, my take is we don't need to go and do the, uh, the, the, the study in regards to that. Because at the end of the day, it's like it would only require us to to reject the the the, the Quran, which you know for me uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, and if we have to spend our lives going and looking at everyone else's uh, supposed you know revelations, again, I, I don't think that that's uh, adequate use of our uh, our time. Personally. Anyone have uh, anything else to uh, discuss to bring up? Um, the thing is, like, um, there are like, you know, people who say they got new scripture and stuff, like, like, um, you know, they have different logic, uh, about how they're not uh, contradicting the Quran. Like, they could be like, oh no, final prophet, just uh, it, it just uh, the word is like. Yeah, like the word, like you know, like Muhammad being a sealed prophet is just like, oh, he's authorized. It doesn't actually mean he's the last one. And they'll be like, oh no, uh, heaven or hell is just allegorical, and there is no such thing. It's just referring to reincarnation. And um, like they they don't really say they contradict the Quran. They just uh, give reasons as to why basically we're misunderstanding the Quran and like how they're not contradicting it like oh no you know who said like you know prof only prophets get scripture or uh, stuff like that and it's kind of hard to like you know i mean th this is one of yeah, this is one of the ways that they they get people is they they just assume that they know the uh the the, the scripture better than the uh, people that they're trying to dupe you know, regarding the aspect of a uh, prophet doesn't receive scripture, it's like, okay, can you show one verse where Rasul is given at a kitab, uh, one verse in the Quran, you know, um, that, that aspect is they're building a understanding similar to a mathematical theorem. Where they have these uh, given facts. They say, okay, you know, if this is true, then this is true. If this is true, then this is, and they built on top of it. All that needs to be done is you take, you know, the, the, the lower down that uh, stack, you can basically attack causes more of their understanding to just crumble and fall apart you you take these core premise you know let's say for instance they say oh there's another scripture to come after the uh, the the quran uh you know the very simple thing is like okay well prove to me that someone other than a nabi is given at a kitab you know and if they can't do that then it's like okay you, you basically have taken down the the very foundation of their entire understanding uh, so it doesn't require to go into the weeds on these other uh, aspects because you, you take the very, you know, foundation of their belief and you just demolish it. No different than Abraham taking the uh, the, the statues and destroying it and leaving only one. You know, um, so if you're looking at a kind of a, a, a way to kind of dismantle that argument, uh, I, I would start there. You take the foundational things that they're arguing, you know, at the core and you find the one that basically just contradicts the, uh, the Quran and try to have them prove otherwise. Because if they're just telling you, no, it doesn't mean that, it's like, okay, well, prove it. Show me via the verses of the Quran that that's not what it means. One of the, the, the blessings we have, too, is that we have, uh, you know, uh, a messenger that has come in our lives that uh, has uh, clarified these matters. So, you know, another facet is like, okay, if they're rejecting the fact that the uh, 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 Rashad Khalifa was a messenger, they're rejecting the mathematical miracle of the Quran. Again, to kind of uh, uh, defend those points, you have to use the, the, the Quran to say, oh, there is no mathematical structure in the Quran. You know, Rashad Khalifa was an imposter. He wasn't really a messenger. Uh, otherwise, you know, they're forming other, you know, again, numerous uh, contradictions with uh, such an un uh, understanding.
I feel like the the big challenge though is you end up spending so much time and energy like i just remember just this engagement i've had with some of these you know supposed uh, messengers in the past like man i've spent like an entire day you know in essence just like uh, writing up something or like you know putting together an argument to kind of just like uh, uh demolish kind of the, uh, the 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 claims they're making you think that there's no shortage of people who are claiming to be a, a messenger of god if you really wanted to, you could spend your entire life, you know, just deconstructing each one of these as they uh, pop up. I just don't think it's a very productive use uh, of time when there's like just these clear kind of blatant contradictions um, that it's like for us, it just it simplifies things. If someone's coming and saying, hey, worship, you know, two gods, like, OK, done. If someone's coming and saying, oh, you know, the Quran is in the final testament. OK, done. Uh, if someone's coming, you know and saying that oh the the previous messengers and prophets they were wrong uh i'm the one who's figured out all the truth and i'm here to kind of like you know uh fix all the this falsehood that they've done it's like okay that's ridiculous done you know rather than having to go and argue every single one of their points you just look at these kind of core contradictions that they form and from that it's like you just have enough peace of mind that it's like okay i have a choice i can either follow the quran or i can follow this other guy's you know uh interpretation just you know simplifies uh, a lot of these uh these matters yeah there is one person um, uh, he is claiming that uh, it's been 30 year uh, revelation been coming to him and their um, group of people maybe they are now thousands or hundreds like they're saying that uh, um, uh, this final means that um, uh, any any uh, male come, uh, sealed male come, come is that is high official and authorized. So this mm. final means that, but it didn't mean that uh, more scripture will not come because... Uh, like they're trying to change the meaning of the word final. Yes, and not only yeah. that, um, they say that uh, all these people understood a different way. Nowadays, um, people will understand different ways. So god uh, god's revelation is that now Wait, is updated new uh, yes updated we need updated people need updated uh, revelations uh, and so that's message what's the the name of their uh, supposed uh, messenger um the the name of this guy is uh, marshall vian summers i mean invite them to the server then you know <laughs> no i don't think i can invite the the because uh we never spoke to him we just uh, heard of him from other people who follow him well i mean uh, more of a reason invite one of his uh supposed followers and uh you know it's like if their uh their arguments hold up uh, you know again these these core principles there's you you reach a juncture either you reject in essence uh uh one of God's confirmed uh, scriptures and confirmed messengers, um, or you know, you reject these uh, these fabricators. Um, me, I, I just I don't know. It's like when people are especially like, oh, this guy's unreachable. This and that. It's like you know, who, silly. It's like you create this aura of uh, uh, you know, this one guy has all the the right understandings, and oh, he's you know too busy to to talk to anyone, and you know, we have to uh, weigh his teachings to them. I don't know. Doesn't smell right. Would you say his name is Marshall? What? Wait, I'll post a I don't know a Wikipedia link. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can check. Yeah, I did. And not only that, you know, there's many other um, new religions, like uh, like one of them is uh, Sikhism, like S I K H. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. It's like. Um, you know many things and uh like for example for sikhism many people have like muslims have also converted to that that so um and i think ahmed was asking uh like you know what's the need to study them but it's kind of like you know 
like we know that rejecting revelations and stuff isn't a good thing so if you know it feels like if it is a revelation from god then shouldn't we like look into it and uh, test and see if we should know. would you would you agree the crown is fully detailed yeah so is it necessary for you to consider another book Mm, no okay that was all i was pointing out Mm. true I feel like God makes the uh, the the religion simplified for us. You know, we have a, a proven scripture; uh, it's validated, it's authenticated. Um, you know, we we need to have that foundation of uh, what it is we believe. There's an expression that says, "If you know, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything." It's the same thing. It's if we say that this Quran's our cornerstone of what we're going to determine. You know, uh, right from wrong, our salvation, our uh, religious duties and obligations. And at that point, it's like, okay, this is the, the, the metric by which we're going to be uh, uh, judging everything else. Um, just It simplifies it for us, uh, rather than going and saying, okay, well, I have this, let me go keep looking and seeing what else is out there. Um, I don't know. It just seems like uh, uh, we have more than enough than uh, uh, we need as far as to uh, be able to get uh, salvation. Um, but it's just, yeah, I mean, you could spend your whole life going through each one of these uh, supposed uh, messengers and prophets. But, you know, when they blatantly kind of contradict the, uh, the, the, the Quran, it's like, you know, what's the point? Um, does anyone know the reason why, like, if you go ask a Jewish or a Christian, like, why they reject the Quran? Like, uh, do they have any valid reasons that they can bring up? Uh, the typical response you'll hear, at least from Christians, and it's a it's a misunderstanding uh, that they think that uh, God is saying that there is going to be no more um, uh, scripture after uh, the, uh, the 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 Bible. What's funny about it is the the same passage is used in the uh, uh, Old Testament, and uh, <laughs> you know obviously we have the New Testament that came after that, right? The Angel. Um, it's like that's typically what it is, and then in the context of the uh, the the Jews, I mean, it really comes down to just uh, uh, racism and uh, bigotry uh, that they reject any other uh, scripture that's coming a- uh, after them. They only want basically from the lineage of the uh, children of Israel um, the, uh, the the understanding. So they're still waiting for their supposed you know Messiah to come. They've just rejected uh, Jesus. They've rejected Muhammad, um, and you know obviously Rashad. Uh, since uh, uh, their uh, uh, you know revelations have been given to them, wait, what passage? What, what so it's passage? the it's a uh, book of Revelations, uh, chapter uh, twenty two, verse uh, nineteen. It says, "Anyone who adds to these words, God will add to them. Anyone who removes from these words, God will remove from them." And what's funny is they added two verses glorifying uh, Jesus afterwards. Interesting enough, um, but you'll see the same passage used, if I'm not mistaken, it's in uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, but obviously, you know, Deuteronomy wasn't the last scripture. So, you know, my my take from that is that look, we don't alter or change or remove God's scripture once they're uh, sent. Um, that we just keep them intact. This is not claiming that this is you know that there isn't going to be any uh, scripture to come afterwards. Most of the reason, if you look, the reason that most people reject, uh, rejected, say, for instance, uh, Jesus, rejected Muhammad, rejected Rashad, is because it contradicts their uh, their belief as far as like, so when it comes to the, 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 the Jews, you know, they impose a lot of these false prohibitions upon themselves. Um, and, you know, Jesus was calling them out for that. Uh, that they added a ton of innovations uh, via the uh, the Talmud to their uh, religion. Uh, when it comes to the uh, Christians so of Muhammad, it's like they see that it's like, look, they've created this trinity. They, they set up Jesus as the Son of God, and the, the Quran demolishes that argument. When it comes to uh, uh, Rashad, it's basically saying, hey, look, the Hadith and the Sunnah and all this other garbage that you've, uh, uh, you know, uh, connected with the uh, religion that has no foundation, it should be, uh, you know, uh, discarded. Um, so they end up forming these like false religions 
when God sends a uh, a messenger to kind of you know purify, uh, they get offended um, and they automatically reject because the core tenet of their religion, which is not what was originally uh, uh, pitched to them, um, it forms a, a contradiction. It's impossible to believe in the Quran and believe in a Trinity, right? It's like those two things are uh, do not um, uh, mesh well. <laughs> Um, that's actually a good point about the Quran being fully detailed. Like, you know, if it is fully detailed, there's really no need for another for book. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not only that it's fully detailed, it's been preserved, right? Yeah. Like, I just don't get how, like, and, like, why so many people, like, come up with these new, like, they claim that they have new revelations and scriptures and stuff. Like, why would they do that? Either delusional or uh, they're looking for power. They're looking for authority. And that's, like, a lot of reasons people do things is they want everyone to say, listen to what I say and follow the way I find uh, fitting. It's it's just uh, it's narcissism. It's uh, totalitarianism. They want a bunch of followers, and there's a reason the vast majority of these people end up becoming. You know, they have like uh, um, uh, commit adultery. They've raped people. They've taken other people's wives. Just a power trip. Yeah, thank you, guys. It's clearer now. Putting the two verses, uh, the uh, the Bible, show that it's like this isn't uh, the Bible isn't the uh, the final scripture. This is Revelations uh, 22, 19 says, If any man shall take away from the words of the book of the pro this prophecy, God shall take away his part uh, out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Actually, uh, 20, it continues, If anyone uh, which will adds to it, that God will add to him. And you'll see a similar commandment in Deuteronomy. Do not uh, add or subtract a thing to what I am commanding you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God. Nowhere does this say that, in essence, is the final script or anything of that nature. It's just saying, don't change what God has sent down, which is, you know, uh, interesting enough what we what we read in the verses uh, uh, today in the uh, previous weeks as well. All right, I am going to bounce, but mashallah, good talk. Good uh, Quran study, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah, peace.
Wait, but what if, uh, I don't know, what if the other book, as Ahmed is saying, what if the other book doesn't bring new details, it's just, it's just basically what the Quran is saying, like the same thing? Then it's, uh, then it's redundant. What does that mean? So, uh, there's no reason for you to believe in it, in that case. You have something that says the same thing. Yeah, but what if it's from God? Wouldn't I have to believe it? No, you don't need to. The Quran says that the, among the Christians and the Jews, there are believers. Among the Jews, there are believers. Jews that uh, didn't accept Jesus. Or the, or the gospel. But God still says that there are believers among them. You don't need to believe in all the books to make it into heaven, according to the Quran. Yeah. So if you know about the Quran, you still don't have to believe in it? Yes. Yes, you don't have to. Unless you no, have the no. proof. Unless you have all the proof. And you reject the proof. And you die as a disbeliever. That's different. But if you just have the Quran and you don't believe it, no, that, that, that doesn't make any difference. You can still make it into heaven. That's not a criteria according to the Quran. Let me explain it like this. If you are a Jew and you see, and you see Jesus performing all these miracles, and and you say and you see him saying God is one. I, I came to deliver the message from God, and you see him doing all these miracles. Uh, then you have to believe, and you can't reject that. If you reject that and you die as a disbeliever, then the Quran says go to hell. But if you don't see any miracles, you just have the book. Yeah, you're free to believe or disbelieve. You don't have to. It's not a criteria to make it into heaven, according to the Quran. But isn't a criteria to live a righteous life? So do you think like disregarding God's revelations would be righteous? There's a difference between disregarding, uh, rejecting and uh, not having the full... Uh, 